Hi, I'm Ashley Ford, and this is 112BK. Coming up, the inaugural Brooklyn Tech Week kicks off early next month. Chance to brush up on blockchain and take a look at how Brooklyn is competing in an ever-changing landscape. If we do not have startup founders and mm -hmm. entrepreneurs trying to figure out how to solve problems and turn those problems into a business, then, and then also hiring people within the community, uh, we have nothing. And then we'll be talking about representation in film, as New York City's top LGBTQ film festival, New Fest, celebrates its 30th year. It's okay for other people to, to, to tell queer stories, but it's, it's definitely, um, I think, really, really important for, you know, queer people to tell their own stories. It can be right. just plain and simple. Just ahead, two filmmakers participating in this year's New Fest, the city's most important LGBTQ film festival, which seems more vital than ever. But first, let's talk tech hubs. There's Silicon Valley, and then there's Manhattan's Silicon Alley here across the river. We don't have anything that rhymes with valley, so we simply have the Brooklyn Tech Triangle. It's not quite as big as Manhattan's yet, but since 2009, employment at tech firms here is up 57%. And tech has become one of the borough's highest paying industries, with average salaries approaching six figures. Time to have a conference to go along with this growth, right? Well, that's what the founders of Brooklyn Tech Week thought. And their inaugural edition kicks off early next month. To tell us about it, we're joined by Nizer Saunders, the event's managing director. Nizer, welcome to 112BK. Ashley, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm so happy to have you here. So how did the idea of Brooklyn Tech Week come about? So um, it was a brainstorming instant moment with Assemblyman Walter Mosley two years ago mm -hmm. when I walked into his office with a group of folks who were actually talking about housing. Mm. how to get more affordable housing to low-income and working-class folks. And after that event, he said, Nizer, I know you produce Harlem Tech Week, and I like what that's all about. And then I gave him a background on how I produce other events around Brooklyn and the city with WeWork and Techstars mm -hmm. to help startups. He said, how can we have a Harlem Tech Week here? And I said, number one, we, won't, we can't call it Harlem Tech Week. Right. right. Brooklyn Tech Week is a start. Mm -hmm. And little did I know that the conversation would spark this great event. And it was two years in the making where, you know, when the idea is just an idea, it takes one or two people to really carry the weight until right. momentum picks up. So I was, I guess, blessed with the task of forging ahead mm -hmm. and connecting people, preaching and saying we gotta have a Brooklyn Tech Week, we need partners to make this happen, and here we are today with some great partners. Mm -hmm. um, and let me just mention one of them because this is important. So Consensus is the largest blockchain company in the world. Right. They also deal with Ethereum, which is a digital currency, just like a dollar bill, but this is digital. You move and buy things online, with Ethereum or Bitcoin, but mm -hmm. here in Brooklyn, Consensus is the number one in the world that deals with blockchain and Ethereum. And they came to us easily, without no hard pitch, we want to be part of Brooklyn Tech Week. You did mention housing earlier, mm -hmm. um, and that that was the initial reason why you had the meeting that led to Brooklyn Tech Week. Yeah. Is Brooklyn Tech Week in any way involved with housing or with affordable housing or with that idea? So I can't say we are involved with affordable housing mm -hmm. because we still are bootstrapping even though we have some great partners mm -hmm. for us to tackle the housing, that's not our expertise. Right. Although I was personally on the board as a board member for a nonprofit organization because I believe that no matter who you are or where you're from, you deserve decent housing, you deserve health. But housing is important because mm -hmm. when you're in a crisis, you need refuge. You need a place to come home to to heal to, to replenish yourself. And if you don't have a home to do that, you're constantly under stress if you're out here day and night trying to figure out what's the next thing 
you're going to do to live, eat, breathe, or make a dollar. Right. Housing is important. Very important. Absolutely. And with all of this new um, tech industry work right here in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. you know, when a lot of people talk about the tech industry and about some of these um, new business developments mm-hmm. here in the borough, the thing that comes up next is gentrification. Yeah. These people are coming and mm-hmm. they're pushing people out. Mm-hmm. Well, do you have any thoughts on that or like how we should be thinking about that and how these companies could be more sensitive to, you know, that reality? You know, I, I do have um, more than a thought on that. Mm-hmm. So I have three daughters. And, and how, what does that mean when we um, talk about technology and the lack of diversity mm-hmm. and um, jobs? Well, I believe that the diversity in tech, the lack of diversity in tech, that is just an extension of discrimination in American history. Right. One thing I do know, when I look back at history books, at the progress of the world, of different communities migrating to America, mm-hmm. our, our, our people's existence in America as uh, African Americans, mm-hmm. we have to have skill set, we have to have jobs, and we have to have, most importantly, ownership of the jobs. Because if we do not have startup founders and mm-hmm. entrepreneurs trying to figure out how to solve problems and turn those problems into a business, then and then also hiring people within the community, uh, we have nothing. Mm-hmm. So to offset the, the lack of diversity, I believe we just need to forge ahead and learn to be job creators, startup founders, mm-hmm. continue with this entrepreneur spirit that we have in our soul, in our right. body. It's here with us. When we look back at the 80s when hip-hop was first being born and on the rise, mm-hmm. the DJs used to scratch. Do you know we created a multi-billion dollar industry? With, these are kids from the hood oh, that yeah. didn't go to Harvard. But somehow the kids who went to Harvard found a way to control our art and turn it into a economic machine that now we're just the consumers of the thing that we created. So we have to figure out how do we reverse that. And it's all about letting more folks in the community have a path to uh, ownership and give them that insight that entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is good for the soul, is, is, it should be part of your education. Is that um, one of the things that will be addressed at the conference, do you absolutely, think? Absolutely. Talk to me a little bit about a person, uh, because that's the exact kind of person who I'm guessing you guys want at this conference, are people who have these ideas and who also are interested in tech, but maybe you know don't think about tech in relation to Brooklyn. They only think about it in relation to San Francisco mm-hmm. or somewhere across the river. And it's like, no, you can do those things right right here, Mm -hmm. what will that person be able to find at the conference? So it's actually two people that will find some great things at the conference. Mm -hmm. It's those who want to know more, want to learn more, Mm -hmm. and it's those who are the experts who already know, already at the top of the food chain in Mm -hmm. tech, but they have to rely on the startup founders to create the ideas. So those are the the two people, the the investors, um, seasoned um, tech leaders, and startup founders and entrepreneurs who want to learn more about what is it that I'm trying to solve, how do I solve it, how do I fix it. Mm -hmm. And these two will come together, exchange information, they will feed each other, nurture each other. And that is traditionally 101 how Silicon Valley was created, Mm -hmm. right? Guys going out to a desert, knowing that they can build something that has to do with conductors, Mm -hmm. but getting it wrong 50% of the time and tapping into their colleagues to get the other other 50% right so that that 50% wrong could be sort of like a learning lesson, but the 50% right. they got right make billions and grow an industry. Right. Wow. That's amazing. So if I want to come to this, if I'm mm-hmm. a person who wants to come to the conference, what do I have to do? Where do I have to go? When do I have to sign up? Yeah. So the conference takes pl- – Brooklyn Tech Week mm-hmm. takes place – November 7th through the 10th. And there are four themes that's happening throughout the week. Day one, we'll have on November 7th, our blockchain crypto summit, where we bring together leaders in the blockchain and crypto space to talk about the future of Mm -hmm. blockchain and where we've been, what investments have been, um, what startups have been invested in, and what does 2019 and 2020 look like. Then we have day two 
uh, which you call Urban TechCon, which is urban technology and smart cities of the future. Mm -hmm. That's dealing with some of the stuff we talked about, about urban um, housing and things like that. How will housing look like in the future? And also, what are the new technology that's going into, like, urban and, and smart cities? So we'll have that on November 8th. November 9th, we'll have Startup Econ, where startup founders will learn to grow and scale their business with experts from Google who will teach them how to do business development or market research. Then we have Started Up, which is a, actually a local organization in Brooklyn, out mm -hmm. of Brooklyn Commons, co uh, Brooklyn Commons, which is a co-workspace. And they'll teach people about um, SEO mm -hmm. and how to make sure that your business is found and on the map and things like that. And mm -hmm. then we wrap up everything with a hackathon on November 10th, which is Saturday at the Bushwick Generator, which is a community hub in Bushwick where um, creatives, people on blockchain can come to the Bushwick Generator mm -hmm. and just be part of all the events that take place year long. So at November 10th is the wrap up and that's right. our BK Urban Hackathon. Right. And you can find out all this and more by logging on to brooklyntechweek.org. And if you forget the org, just Google it. I think we're yeah. all over the place right now. <laughs> right. So just Brooklyn Tech Week. Yes, right. All right. So in the minute we have left, can you quickly tell me what is PitchNATO? Oh, cool. So PitchNATO is the opportunity for a startup founder and entrepreneur to pitch their business. Mm -hmm. But it's not just so simple, right? Because they'll be judged by investors, um, tech leaders who have successfully raised millions and sold millions and billions, mm -hmm. and, then they, and then their peers. They'll be in the room for like three minutes pitching, talking about their business, their, their market fit, and why someone should invest with them. And then after that, we have segments where they will go to different tables and meet experts at these tables mm -hmm. to just have one-on-one -on -one to figure out, like, what's good and what's bad about their pitch. Wow. And then they get to, like, just talk to their peers and see if it just really stick. So Pitch NATO is the trifecta of pitching to seasoned investors and going around our workshop tables to see if your pitch is really good and then talking to your peers because your peers will tell you in a heartbeat, dude, right. that sucks. Yes, they will. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, Nizer. I really appreciate it. I hope that Brooklyn Tech Week is a fantastic success and you guys have a huge turnout. Oh, and not to mention, there are a lot of uh, free giveaways, free tickets. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, 90% of Brooklyn Tech Week is free, only if you are RSVP. And I just want to say this. So I've been checking out your show for off and on for the past year. Mm -hmm. And you are like literally like the Oprah of BK. You're doing your thing. Thank you very much, Nancy. Yeah. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. You have a great day. You too. It's one of the oldest and most storied LGBTQ film festivals in the country. And this year, it celebrates its 30th anniversary. It's called New Fest, and over the years, it's provided space and support for its community to share stories, inspire dialogue, and help shift cultural bias. There are over 50 films in this year's lineup, and we're honored to be joined by two of the filmmakers. Gustavo Sanchez, director of I Hate New York. Welcome to 112 VK. Thank you. And for me. Caroline Burler, director of Dykes Camera Action. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. You guys, uh, first of all, these titles of these films, way to go. I'm in for both of them right away based off the title alone. But Gustavo, tell me, how did you get involved with New Fest? How? Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, uh, New Fest was always like in my horizon, you know? Mm -hmm. It was a place to go, definitely, because the film has been shot in New York during ten, ten years, right. so it was such a you know a place to go definitely. Right. So well, we submit the the film and we are here. So yes. it's, <laughs> it's kind of a miracle, miracle for me, you know. Oh, wow. It's a dream to be here. Gosh, and how about you, Caroline? Same here. Um, New Fest is one of the most prestigious LGBT festivals in the world. Um, I'm a local New Yorker, so to have my film play at New Fest mm -hmm. is a really big deal to me. And yeah, I, I submitted my film and they took it and I'm happy to be, you know, the centerpiece documentary and it's, it's a real honor. The centerpiece documentary. Tell me what that means real quick. I think they pick a few uh, centerpiece films to highlight. Um, mm -hmm. Last night was the, was 1985, which I think is 
one of the centerpiece films. Rafiki is one of the centerpiece films. Mm. So um, just a special little uh, rec recognition for the film, which is cool. I love that. And in your hometown. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. Gustavo, your film, I Hate New York, we're going to watch a clip from it. And I think we're going to meet the four main characters. Can you tell us a little bit before we watch the clip about what the film is about? Wow. That's a super long story. Yeah. So I will try <laughs> to make it short. Uh, I think it's, it's a portrait, a very intimate portrait of four uh, artists and activists from New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been, you know, going with them and through their lives. And, well, this is a pretty intimate portrait that you right. will discover on the screen. Fantastic. Let's take a look. There's always been geographic places that have attracted outsiders or people who are different from where they come from. And New York is famously one of those. Welcome to my home. I think that you just, you should always live your life to, to the fullest and um, not deny yourself anything. I knew from a very young age that I needed to leave where I was at, that I want people to say, she's she, she's her. I do live on the edge. I was really fresh off the farm. When I walk here, there's ghosts. I portrayed four kind of uh, transgender people. I never approached to them right. because, th because they were transgender people. I right. approached to them because they were transgressive people, mm. you know, people like going against the grain, like yes. fighting against so many stuff in their lives. So I, I felt that they were really, they, they, their stories were really important right. and not enough represented in like conventional media. Mm -hmm. So I felt my role here is to give them like kind of a platform mm -hmm. with all my work on all during all this year to give them a platform to to sound this this you know these stories all around the world we are yes. making our theatrical release uh, next month in Spain yes. with Warner Bros can you imagine this wow. i mean in Spain i mean in english a documentary in english wow caroline talk to me a little bit about what your film is about in general yeah it's sort of tells the arc of lesbian cinema starting pre-Stonewall with some of the r more negative uh, mm -hmm. representations. You see suicidal lesbians and lesbians being killed by trees that are falling over. <laughs> and then finally, the 70s sort of marks a turning point, feminism, the LGBT movement, Barbara Hammer becoming the, you know, a pioneer in this, in this um, history and with her films starting in the, in the 70s. And so, yeah, it's sort of, and then coming up to the present with the more recent films that are out there. We actually have a clip uh, about how, at one time, lesbians were only portrayed in vampire films. So let's take a look. Lesbians and vampires, that was the one place where you could find lesbian pleasure on screen. Rose Trachet used to talk about being driven to make go fish because she and Gwen couldn't stand watching The Hunger one more time at their local bar. It was really about making something that was sweet and a, like a love story. It's about two women who want girlfriends. We're sick of being depressed when we see gay films. They got into Sundance. Filmmaking went hand in hand with activism. There really was a sense in which we were all trying to make a new world. We needed to make ourselves utterly visible. One of the things um, that we're seeing are more and more LGBTQ stories and voices in the mainstream. But there are some blind spots, obviously. There are some voices that don't get out there as much. There are some marginalized communities whose stories are continue to be told the same way over and over and over, which means, again, like a lot of um, lesbian women in history and film, uh, dying in tragedy uh, all the time. But one of the things that I keep thinking about is who's allowed to tell these stories, right? It made me think of, I was listening to a, an interview with Jill Soloway talking about how Jeffrey Tambor played right. the lead transgender role and transparent and how it's hard for transparent 
for transgender people to watch yes. because it's it's not coming from that you know specific perspective so that's an important thing to understand it's super important for people to get to tell their own story mm -hmm. and i think that's that's been something we've really had to overcome right to be able to feel empowered to tell our own stories and in, in that in itself empowering us further all right so gustavo how is new fest unique to any of the other film festivals you've attended wow that's such a, such a question i mean we've been in so many uh, prestigious and uh, general film festival. But for me, uh, being underlined here in, in, in New Fest, New York, is like, uh, as I told you, like a dream. Right. It's, I mean, it's the 30th anniversary, and I think it's the only Spanish film uh, on screen this year. Wow. So, you know, for me, it's kind of uh, an achievement. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, after so many years of working in this city, I feel like kind of uh, embraced. embraced by the city, yes. And uh, it's not only about me. Mm -hmm. it's, for me, it's mostly about the voices that I've portrayed mm. in the documentary, the four main uh, protagonists. It's okay for other people to, to, to tell queer stories, but it's, it's definitely, um, I think, really, really important for you know, queer people to tell their own stories. It, it means right. just plain and simple. Absolutely. So it's more so, I, I guess, what I'm hearing from you is that it's about making sure the people in the community mm -hmm. have those opportunities as well. Uh -huh. It's not that it should only be some people. It's more so that, like, yeah, but these people should yeah. probably get the opportunity they need to, to be tell. first in line. <laughs> yeah, they need to be first in line yeah. before anyone else. How about you, Gustavo? Absolutely. Well, I agree, but in, uh, in some way, I think it's a matter, basically, it's a matter of uh, respect. Mm. Uh, so in my case, in my particular case of I Hate New York, uh, what I've done is that to give voice to them, and I mean, they, they came to me with their stories, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I let them to, to explain, I let them, uh, you know, space and time to, you know, to really develop their ideas, their, yes. their, their, their way, the way they, they live, the way they uh, create, uh, mm -hmm. the way they feel everything. Uh, so I think it's a matter of respect. And Caroline, can you tell me, how do people come and see your film? How do they come and participate in the festival? Because these are both going to be works, I think, that people are really going to gravitate to. Not just because it's, you know, you got a special award, mm -hmm. but also because it's an important film. It's, um, you know, one of the things that I keep thinking about is sort of like a lost history and a missed history mm -hmm. and how often you don't get people telling these stories who are part of the community and who get to really drill down on something so specific. Mm -hmm. So how does somebody like me, who's really interested in that, Come check it out. Well, it will be raining this weekend, but mm -hmm. despite that, be. I hope you will come <laughs> um, 6 p.m. to the SBA Theater on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have Barbara Hammer. We're going to have Sue Friedrich, Jenny Olson, Rachel Reichman, some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the cast members. The Dykes of Dykes Camera Action will be there. <laughs> yes. And, um, yeah, it's going to be a great night. Uh, we're going to just screen the film and then have a nice little panel afterwards. Mm -hmm. And um, people can ask questions directly to the filmmakers and to me. And so it, it, that's, 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 the, that's the way to come see it. And how do I buy tickets in advance? You can buy tickets at newfest.org, mm -hmm. uh, find Dyke Scream Action in the selection, and Gustavo's home's playing tonight. Gustavo, your film's playing tonight? Yes. This is the premiere? Yes. If people can't come see it tonight, then how do they, when, when else will it be playing? Will it be playing, continuing to play during the festival? Yes, tomorrow okay. again. Tomorrow, tomorrow again. again at 7 p.m. Tomorrow Friday. Tomorrow Friday. Friday, that's yes. it. Yes, and then, and that's the last time? Yes. Okay, so, so Friday, they need to go see it if they want to see it. So I'll probably be there. <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here. I really appreciate your time, and I can't wait for more people to check out these films, and just think you're as brilliant as I do. Thank you Thank you. Much. And now some news. Former Assemblymember Pamela Harris, who resigned from her 46th district seat after being arrested earlier this year, has been sentenced following conviction for witness tampering and multiple counts of fraud. 
Harris defrauded both FEMA's disaster relief efforts following Hurricane Sandy and a charity for underserved children in Coney Island, stealing just over $70,000, according to the U.S. attorney. Now she's sentenced to six months in prison and 400 hours of community service. On Saturday, October 20th, a couple of weeks before they hear the starter's pistol at the New York City Marathon, runners can look forward to the Brooklyn Marathon. NYC Runs announced earlier this year that its signature event will take place on the streets of Brooklyn for the first time in the event's eight-year history, instead of staying inside Prospect Park. Runners will pass through historic neighborhoods like Crown Heights, Flatbush, and Park Slope, though the race will still end in the park. Terrace Bagels will be providing carbs at the finish line if that sweetens or glutens the deal for anyone. During an MTA board meeting on Wednesday, Chairman Joseph Lotus said steep fare hikes may be in store for the subway if the agency is unable to secure more solid sources of funding. The budget deficit could also lead to reduction in service, which could mean fewer buses per route or the nixing of entire bus routes altogether. The agency has already announced several cuts to spending, like fewer train cleanings, reduction of night staff, limiting manual track inspections to once a week, and the postponement of new select bus service routes until 2021. Everything is terrible. Life is a nightmare. Keep your chin up. Despite touting major improvements across various NYCHA developments aimed at curbing heat and hot water outages, more than 35,000 public housing residents have already faced this season's cold without heat. Even on the day the city announced the upgrades to NYCHA heating units, nearly 4,000 residents experienced outages. During cold fronts last winter, between October 2017 and January 2018, more than 80% of NYCHA residents had to deal with heat outages lasting 48 hours on average, eventually leading Governor Cuomo to declare a state of emergency for NYCHA. Stay warm out there, Brooklyn. And that's the show for today. See you next week and have a great weekend.